Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus from the University of Tsukuba and today we are beginning our third lecture on the Experiment Designs for Computer Science course. The topic for today is a statistical inference and the lecture today will be actually one of the most important lectures of this course. So I would like everyone to really pay attention and if you think you did not understand some part of this lecture, feel free to ask questions on the comments or on Manaba or just see the lecture again and talk. Uh, if you have difficulties with this lecture, the following lectures will build on this one. So make sure you get, uh, you get a good idea of what we're talking about here before you continue on the course. So let's go. So uh, in the last lecture, we talked about descriptive statistics. So we talked about using the mean as the mean of the sample as an estimate for the mean of the population, the variance of the sample as an estimate for the variance of the population, etc. And we also talked about the uh, confidence interval, which is an interval estimator. And the point and the interval estimator they are very useful to define the value of parameters in the population. However, in some cases, this is not enough. Some in some cases, we need decision-making tools to, make, uh, to deal with information that we get from random samples. In these cases, one of the tools that we can use is called statistical inference. And statistical inference is a technique that can help us make a decision based on a random sample. So let's give an example of what we're talking about when we say we're making a decision. Imagine that you are the owner of a factory that produces chocolate. So the factory should produce uh, packages of chocolate with 300 grams of chocolate powder. Okay, now you want to know if the operation of your factory is okay or if there is any problem. So what do you do? You take a sample of 30 packages. You produce 30 packages of your chocolate and you measure, so that's your sample. Uh, and then using the, the lecture, the tools from lecture two, you calculate the mean, the mean weight of the sample. Uh, and with a 95% confidence interval, uh, the, the confidence interval for the mean of the, 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 mean, the mean estimator is from 283 to 377 grams. Okay, now here's the question. Is everything normal? Like when you look at this confidence interval, 283 to 307, okay? We know from the last class that this interval has a 95% chance to include the real value of the population mean. So does this mean that your factory is actually producing 300 grams on average? Remember that this is a very important point. 300 grams is one of the values of this confidence interval. However, the confidence interval itself does not tell us which value is more likely. The only thing that the confidence interval says is that the calculation of the confidence interval say that the, the, the mean should be somewhere between 283 grams to 307. So what do you do? Do you send an auditor to see if there is anything wrong and to fix, or do you keep producing chocolate as everything is normal? So in this case, uh, the confidence interval will not help you make a decision. You will need a different sort of tool. And that's, these are the infer statistical inference tools that we're going to talk about in this lecture. Now, uh, before we begin that, let's go to what we did in the first and second lecture and talk a little bit about science in general. Today, I would like to introduce uh, Florence Nightingale, also known uh, for nickname the lady with the lamp for her actions uh, with the British uh, army. So <clears throat> Florence Nightingale, well, one thing about her is that her birthday is now said the International Day of Nursing and of the nursing profession, and it was 12th of May, just two days ago. So it's kind of like an on-topic uh, on theme, 
Okay, and, but she did great contributions. Last week, we're talking about how to represent data, how to collect data to learn more about uh, the world. And she is a great example of that. So Florence Nightingale, she is a British nurse and mathematician. Uh, one thing that is interesting is that when she was young, her parents were against uh, her will of becoming a nurse because at her time, nursing was not seen exactly as a profession. It was something that people helped with the real doctors, but the nurses themselves, they were not seen at, uh, as, um, as real professionals. And Florence Nightingale was one of the persons that had a very great influence uh, uh, to uh, transform nursing into a profession. Uh, she did that by developing several techniques for nursing, writing textbooks about how nursing needs should be done, and generally like formalizing the profession of a nurse. So she gave great contributions for the professionalization of nursing and for data visualization in general. And this is one of the cool things about her in the next slide. She was the mother of infographics. So if you look at a, a news and it gathers lots of data and showing a very cool way that you can easily understand what's going on. Well, this is, was something that uh, you probably have a lot to thank uh, Florence Nightingale. So what she did is that she used to collect data when she was working during the war or when she was working in the hospital. She would collect data about how many people got sick and how many people died and Describe it. So what we're seeing here in this slide is one of her uh, one of her infographics. So as you can read here, it's kind of hard in this font, but it's the di diagram of causes of mortality in the army in the east. So you have I cannot really read this, but um, you have several different causes of death, and by putting then all the data in the same uh, in the same graph, you could think okay because of this, maybe I should pay attention more to this part, or maybe I should pay attention to more, maybe we should put more effort on that sort of um, activities that reduce the cause of death. So uh, very interesting. Also, uh, she was um, very, uh, she, uh, she implemented the use of hand washing in the hospital for nurses. So in her time, uh, it was not obvious that nurses should be washing their hands before dealing with patients. And she did, she used that to um, to re, to reduce the mortality ratios. So she did her uh, her uh, contributions to how nurses should act based on the information she did by rigorous data collection. Her nickname of the lady with the lamp was that she used to go around the hospital at night to collect data, holding her lamp and talking to people around. Uh, she was said, from what I heard, her, read, read about her, she was said to be very strict, very strict about that. So she was a person that was very about, okay, very no nonsense. So that was <clears throat> that was very, uh, a, a very interesting figure. So yes, um, it's interesting to know where these um, customs that we have now about data collection and data presentation have came from. A second point I would like to raise today before we get to the class. Uh, I read a very interesting paper uh, this week. It's a preprint by Musgrave et al. Um, and the basic idea is that he and his colleagues, uh, they did an analysis of several machine learning methods uh, used on metric learning. So learning of metrics for other, for other problems. And it was very interesting because he observed uh, these on the left, this data that you see is the cumulative literature. So here we have several papers as time goes on. And there is like the, the implementation, the, the proposal of several different algorithms. And we can see here in the literature uh, review that the, uh, the, the methods become better and better over time. Uh, on different uh, on different test sets. However, what they did is that they re-implemented all of these methods, but before testing them again, they um, did a fine tuning of the parameters using the same techniques for fine tuning for all the parameters, all the hyperparameters of the methods. 
And what they found out is that when you fine tune the different the hyperparameters for the different metrics, the results were very similar among of them. They could not see such a large difference as we see in the left graph. And this is something I mentioned last, uh, I think I mentioned two weeks ago about um, the reprodu um, reproducibility crisis that was in psychology and medicine a few years ago. And this is a evidence that this could also happen in computer science. Um, because of unfair comparisons, you get we get uh, false results. So the real result is that the different methods used for metric learning, they had about the same performance. But because we did not perform um, proper hyperparameter tuning of the methods that we were comparing against, what we saw was a slow improvement of the state of the art. So this is why uh, these fair comparisons are very important. Without these fair comparisons, you can reach, even without noticing, on false results about your research. What are fair comparisons in computer science? Of course, uh, the definition of fair comparison depends on exactly what you are studying. But here are some points to think about when you are performing a comparison between computer science method to decide if the comparison is fair or not. So for instance, like in the paper of Musgrave et al, uh, fine tuning of hyperparameters is very important. So you should, if you're fine tuning the, the parameters of your method, you should fine tune the parameters of all the other methods using the same method. Okay. Also, uh, what happens very often is you're really trying to find a new algorithm to solve a certain problem. So you start with an idea and you implement that idea. And you notice that some of the, some of the operators in your method, they're not working so well. So you remove them and then you try again. And then you modify your method and then you try again. And then you modify your method and then you try again. So these failed variations, what you're not noticing, especially if you're doing training data and testing data, and you are comparing these variations on the testing data, what you are actually doing, the variations of your method are also a kind of hyperparameter. So by trying different variations on the same testing data, your test data now has become the training data. So you are, by, by modifying your algorithm and trying again on the same data over and over and over, you are overfeeding to that data. And when you compare against the literature, that comparison will be unfair. So you need to have a separate set of data that you have not used yet with any of your variations. And that will be the data that you have to actually test against. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's the next point. So fine tuning of the algorithm itself on the training data. Also, only comparing on data favorable to one of the algorithms. So you figure out that, you're, of course, when you're developing a new algorithm, you want it to deal with certain special cases. No algorithm is good at everything. So, but however, when you're presenting your paper, when you're presenting your results, you need to be very clear what kind of properties of the data your algorithm is exploiting. And in what cases this exploitation does not work. So that's the fair comparison, showing the good points, but also showing the negative points. So it can be a clear uh, view of the, the positives and negatives of the new proposed methods. One thing that's often not uh, really noted is also that software engineering evolves with time. And with new li modern libraries, modern libraries, they, are, they have better performance, they have fewer bugs, and they, have more general, they are more general than older libraries. So when you get a method that is very old, even if you go and execute the method again, the older libraries, they may have bugs or they may have um, inefficiencies that new algorithms uh, may exploit. So you program a new algorithm using the newest library and you compare with an old, older version of an old algorithm with an older library. And is the performance of your algorithm because of your proposal? Or is the performance of your algorithm because of your new library? So you need to check that out. Also, uh, this is something that mostly everyone takes care, but it's worth mentioning, different computational environments. 
So if you just take results from old papers without re-implementing the methods, maybe these old results are because of computational limitations. Like if you have a paper that was 20 years ago, that was published 20 years ago, well, 10, we, 20 years ago, we did not have GPUs for, uh, ex, for computational experiments as we have today. So the, the results of 20 years ago, they may be limited on computational power and you need to make sure that this comparison is still relevant. So these are just some of the recommendations, but really think of, think carefully about your experiment design to see if you're not giving an unfair advantage to the algorithms that you are proposing. Remember of these results, uh, unfair comparisons may result in false results and you don't want your results to be false, right? All right, now that we talk a little bit about science in general, let's go into this lecture. So uh, the topics of this lecture, uh, we're gonna have these four topics. What is a statistical inference? Statistical hypothesis and errors. Z-testing on a single, in single sample. And statistical testing assumptions. Um, I'm gonna take a quick break now. Um, and then we're gonna start with statistical inference. See you on the next video.